Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk on uh, day two problems with Axon. Um, I've been asked to use a mic. I'm not very used to doing that. Usually I just shout loud enough so everyone can hear me, but I'll, I'll use the mic for now. Um, so my name is Joris Kuipers. Uh, I work for Trifork as uh, what I like to call a hands-on architect. Uh, I am the CTO as well, uh, because uh, our former CTO is actually Allard, who left to form his own company. Um, and occasionally I, uh, I still do uh, trainings and other things as well, so uh, I dabble in a lot of things at the moment. And um, uh, I think it was probably over a half a year ago already uh, that I uh, sent in an abstract to, uh, to do a talk here on, on day two problems with, uh, with Axon. Um, I have a lot of Axon experience. I have actually taken over some projects uh, in Trifork from Allard uh, on, um, uh, for a number of clients who have been building systems with Axon uh, for, for many years already. And that's mostly what I'm going to draw my experiences from this talk. However, um, it's been a while since I've done Axon uh, for uh, like the last year and a half already. Uh, I've been working on an integration platform for the Dutch lotteries. And uh, that's a stateless set of microservices. It, it's heaven, basically. I have no front end and I have no state to store. Uh, so I'm, I'm just delegating and I'm making state someone else's problem. This is why I'm now also into management. I'm, I'm learning about this stuff, so I'm making things other people's problems. Um, however, uh, in this talk, I would like to uh, discuss the things that you will actually run into or that I ran into in my experience when, when building a system, stateful system with Axon. Um, I will have some answers. Uh, fortunately, I will also have some things that I just found hard and that I may not necessarily have answers to. But at least I will leave you with a lot of new questions uh, that you probably even hadn't thought of if you are just getting started with this whole CKRS event sourcing thing. So, um, just very briefly, uh, why do people uh, start building systems with Axon? And that typically means, why do they start building a CQRS and event sourcing based system? And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And uh, when I was writing this abstract, I noticed that a lot more people were talking about this. A couple of years ago, uh, when Axon development was uh, still in the 1.0, 2.0 days, this was sort of a niche. Right? It, it, not a lot of people knew about terms like CQRS. Um, uh, but nowadays, and all, uh, I think this started about maybe a year and a half ago, probably together with the, uh, the rise of uh, popularity of microservices projects, um, a lot of blogs, uh, talks at conferences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were appearing on people advocating for building systems in this new way. Because it has a lot of actual benefits. Um, you can for, uh, follow a DDD approach, and it, it maps very naturally, typically when you're doing CQRS and event sourcing. It's not the only way, but it's definitely a good way of doing things. And that allows you to focus on actually modeling and solving the business problems rather than just being uh, tied down and bogged down into all sorts of technology issues all the time. Um, but from a technology point of view, one of course of the main benefits of doing CQRS is that you have your read and your write model separately. So you can scale them separately, you can think about them differently, um, you can have multiple read models. Uh, you can, that means that they can be more effective, effective in querying, but it can also mean that they're optimized just to make it easier to work with. Um, you get all the trails, it's a big one. Uh, a lot of uh, clients I know of Exonic are mostly focused on this. They want to have a single source of truth that will always tell them what happened when and where in their system. And it cannot just be some side effect it has to be the actual thing used by the system, otherwise it's not good enough as an audit trail. And you get it basically for free if you're doing event sourcing. Um, you can change your mind, you can come up with new ideas and you can say, well, uh, I have been running this system for a year already, and now I want to have uh, some new uh, ways of, of looking at the data. And then instead of building something and saying, well, from now on, new data will actually be available in this way, you can actually do that after the fact, and you can just rerun all of your events through something. And you can say, we're going to just pretend that this system was always able to do this, even with data from a year ago already, which is a really nice capability. And um, a, a big push, like I said, is the move that people are making towards microservices. Because events can be, and I'm going to talk more about this, can be a great way to, uh, to decouple your systems. So basically, it's, it's, it's amazing, Mike. And it was really nice that I, uh, I, over, I was listening to Allard this morning, and he was actually saying, but wait, there is more, because out of the commercials, this is exactly it, right? This is what, what a lot of the, uh, the current advertisement and, and, and evangelism around CQRS and event sourcing focuses on. 
And it's, it's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to cover basically what happens after this honeymoon phase is over. And now you're actually running in production with a system that uses CQRS and event sourcing. Then what? And, and the reason I wanted to do this talk was that I don't hear enough of this. There must be a lot of people doing this already, having this actual experience. But not too many people, apparently, seem eager to share it. And uh, I think that's a pity, because I think there's a lot to learn here and a lot to learn about from each other about, about doing these sort of things. So problems that I've seen, for example, is that people start to build these sorts of systems too early. Right? You're a startup, you need to get something running in production really quickly. You don't really understand the domain yet, but still you're, you're just going to put this somewhere. And of course, people will change their minds, there will be new insights, models change because you can never get the thing right from the first go. But now already you have all of these events that map onto certain aggregates, but the, the split that you actually made into aggregates uh, it doesn't really fit the way that we look at the world now rather than uh, a couple of months back. And that can be uh, hard to deal with, um, these sort of refactorings. Also, um, a lot of the promises that you hear around microservices are things like, yeah, now we'll be able to do continuous deployments and we'll be able to, uh, to be faster than everyone. Uh, uh, there was a t in the talk this morning, we saw that, how important it actually is to be able to do all of these frequent deployments and how much more effective it makes you and how happy it makes your developers. That's not always easy when you're, when you're dealing with a system like this. Um, so you might need to actually schedule for, for a regular downtime there. Um, also, when people actually start to split things up, and this is not <laughs> an exclusive problem to CQRS and event sourcing, I think it, you see it a lot when people go from a monolith to a distributed architecture, is that they find out that the way that they actually split things up still forces them to actually deploy everything together. Because, well, there is still a lot of coupling there. And um, also, if you're used to just building traditional systems, just CRUD, uh, just store current state and that's it, uh, because you only have current state, it's actually also quite easy also to then make changes to that state. It's, it's just a SQL update away typically. So you're going to use a tool like Flyway and as part of your deploy, you can just say, oh yeah, we, we had some mistakes in the data there, so we're just going to patch that up. And we're just going to add a new column there and we're done. And that's your deployment. Uh, that doesn't really work if you want to do proper event sourcing and everything in your system has to actually be covered by and described by events. You have to make sure that these events are there, even in the case of things like fixes. So you'll, you're going to need custom tooling for that. So that's the sort of thing I'm going to be talking about here. So uh, let's say we are deploying an app that uses CQRS and event sourcing. Um, could be with Axon, because we're at Axon Conference, but uh, most of this stuff is not really specific to Axon in any way. What typically goes into an update there? So obviously, first of all, we're going to have new events, right? We've added new functionality. And typically, when you add new functionality to an existing application, that means you're going to end up with new events describing the new things that happened in your app. But not only that, you're also going to have expanded events. You might have additional information that's relevant for things that were already supported. So you're going to add some fields. It could also be that it's not, in fact, new information, but it's actually more of a content enrichment of your events to make life easier on your event consumers. So that instead of having to derive and, and track a state themselves, they will actually get more state as part of the event. Your aggregates can have additional state. That's actually quite common. One of the things I really like about this whole idea of, of CQRS and event sourcing is that initially uh, your aggregates can have as little state as they actually need to perform their business logic and make their decisions about the incoming commands. And then later on, when you find out, oh, but now I actually need to have some additional state, you can just add that. And again, because of the power of event sourcing, it will be like that state had been there forever. A uh, common example, uh, we had an application where we had a user aggregate. And if someone would actually log into the system, that was a command. Um, because there is a lot of good reasons for wanting to actually track login events, for example. And maybe you now have a requirement where you say, well, I actually want to make sure that uh, if someone logs in uh, too often within a certain uh, period, uh, then uh, we're going to track that or we're going to add a delay or we're going to block the account or whatever like that. Or maybe you want to have a password policy and say you cannot actually change your password to something you already used in the last three months. If you have events, you can do this very easily by just updating your aggregate state to say, oh, I'm actually going to track the last couple of passwords, hashes. Please do not store plain text passwords in your aggregates. Um, and then they compare that whenever someone wants to change their password. Right? That's easy. However, there is a significant effort involved in changing aggregate state as well. we'll talk about. And finally, of course, you're going to have new uh, query projections and query state. We want to be able to see new or additional data 
in our systems. So let's start with this, this new eventing thing. Um, as part of an update, I want to be able to deal with new events in my application. So I'm going to be deploying that out there. And now this application will start to produce these new events and stores them in some event store. That could be your own database table. It could be Axon server. Um, one thing that's interesting there is that, by definition, it's a new event. So the old version of your application doesn't know about these events. What happens then if we want to do a blue-green deploy without downtime? So we're running the old version of the application. In parallel, we're going to deploy the new version of the application. That will start to produce these new events. And now the old version starts to do an event sourcing action or simply has some other listeners that update query projections. And they start to see these events that they've never seen of and never heard of. That could actually uh, easily cause your old application to just choke on these events and to stop working. Um, so then you cannot actually do this blue-green deploy anymore. Um, if it's not about the, um, let's say, the event sourcing of your aggregates, if it's about maybe even external systems listening in onto these events, you could have the same problem, right? All of a sudden, your application starts broadcasting new event types, and external event processors don't know about these things. Um, it fully depends on how you build your systems and what type of event you are describing, if that, if that is a problem or not. But it's definitely something that you will need to actively consider and think about when you start to do these sort of things. So um, something that I think everyone should be aware of, but I'll mention it here just in case, is uh, this idea of Postel's law, um, who was uh, someone who was involved with a lot of the uh, internet protocols that make still the internet tick today. And he had a, uh, a principle, the robustness principle, sometimes referred to as Postel's law, that says you should be conservative in what you do. So that means conservative in requests that you send out or uh, things that you publish and make sure that it's always consistent and that people know what to expect. But on the other hand, you should be liberal in what you accept from others. Don't be too strict in validating things against schemas, for example. Um, don't be scared to handle something where there is some additional information that you don't know what it is. Because, well, if you don't know what it is, you probably don't care about it that much. So be liberal in what you accept. And that will make easy easier to interchange and to, to evolve systems without continuously breaking compatibility. So what, what I would like to propose in this talk, this is first time ever, so you're here, is the Kuiper's events corollary to Postel's law. And what my events corollary is, is you should be conservative as a CQRS event sourcing system in the things that you actually publish publicly, publicly right? in the events that you want others to be able to, to read and to understand. But you should be liberal in what you accept, not only from others, but actually from your, your past and future self. It's very important when you think about evolving a CQRS event-based application that older and newer versions of the application will have some way and what way exactly depends fully on your needs, but to coexist in a way. So as a rule of thumb, how this translates is basically into my, uh, my corollary that says, if you don't know about it, <laughs> you probably don't care about it. Right? This is not a generic life advice, by the way. Uh, this is something that you should be following when it comes to handling events in an event sourcing application. You can, in fact, ignore what you don't know then. And you should probably. Because you're building services, you're building systems with the idea that they have a job to handle. And to do that, they will process events coming in. And if they learn about other new events, and they don't know what they are, then apparently it's not events that they actually need to do their job. I'm saying apparently because it could also be that you simply forgot to update an application and actually it was super important that it did know about this new event, right? So this could be a mistake. But in general, it's a good practice to follow this. That means you shouldn't be throwing exceptions, for example, in an event handler that updates query projections, whenever it encounters a new event type. If it doesn't know about the type, it probably doesn't care. Um, it's also true for new fields. If you add new fields to events and uh, event handlers don't know about it yet, so they only know about the, the stuff that was already there. That's fine. Just ignore the new fields, because if they don't know about them, well, they probably don't care about them. And again, it's probably, right? Only you, as a developer, know if this is true or not. So this is not something you can simply take for granted. You still have to think about this stuff. But it works quite well, in my experience, as a rule of thumb, especially for external event processors. However, this becomes a lot harder when you're actually thinking about just two versions of the same application that do um, event sourcing in an aggregate. 
Because now all of a sudden you have an application that says I'm going to be reading my own events to be building up this new aggregate that I have. Yeah, is it safe then to just ignore new events that were produced by a newer version of the same application? And that could be the case when you're doing a blue-green deploy, but the same situation applies if you're doing a rollout, and then after an hour you find out, oh shit, there is something really wrong with this version of the application, so we're just going to quickly do a rollback. Doing that rollback might not necessarily involve restoring the database back to the state of an hour ago. Right? It may not be an option to do that. So in that case, you're going to have new events in your event store that are just unknown to your current application. And that requires forward compatibility in that case. Your old application would need to be compatible with stuff that it didn't know about yet. And by default, this doesn't work. Yeah, with Axon, if you're going to try this, it will fail. And it's, that's, I think, a good thing. It doesn't make sense to assume for an event sourcing aggregate that it's just safe to ignore stuff that it should be knowing about, but it doesn't. <laughs> because that's way too tricky. There can be all sorts of important new business logic being part of those events. Um, so don't just ignore them there. You have to design for this to do forwards compatibility if, and I say if you want this. Now, ideally I would now be all telling you how to just do this, right, in your applications. In practice, in my experience, this is super hard. If you actually want to build a, an application using event sourcing that is forwards compatible so that it can run in parallel or it can run against rollback versions of your application, it's super hard to think about. If you're building, if you're an architect and you're guiding a big team of people, like 10 people building on this, and you all have to actually make these people understand what this means and continuously check if they're not making a mistake in this. And then also make sure that you actually test this. So you're actually going to go the extra route and do these sorts of deployments of new versions and then check if the old application can deal with it. This is super hard. It might be worth it. However, in my experience, Pretty often this is simply not done. I've talked to a lot of people where I've asked questions on this when I was struggling with this. Like, how do you deal with this? And very often the answer is, well, oh, we're, we're just accepting downtime. So this is something to think about because it means this is a choice that you, that you have to deliberately make if you're going to go this route. Um, if you are in the situation where this is acceptable, it's super nice because it's, it saves you a ton of problems that you don't have to think about anymore. Um, and that means typically they're going to just aim for roll forward. If there is a problem, make sure you're doing frequent and small deploys, like the best practices from microservices are already, so that if you do introduce a new problem, instead of just saying, oh my god, we're panicking, we're just going to do a rollback to the previous version, you will be able to just quickly fix the problem and roll out a new version of your application instead. Typically, it's a way better approach. And I think this is true in general but it's especially true for these sorts of applications. Make sure, of course, to still have emergency backups in case you do have to do a rollback. And then it might be acceptable to say, well, uh, we, we have lost a couple of minutes of new state if we, have, if we ever in, go into this situation. But again, there is no uh, absolute here. It fully depends on your domain, on your application. So this is something you really need to think about. Um, when it comes to external event processors, I find the situation is fortunately a lot better. Here, dealing with things that are newly introduced and that your event processor doesn't know about tends to be fairly easy. Um, however, the common approach that I see is that people building systems in Java with Axon, they will just propagate their events, they will marshal them to JSON or to XML, but they will then unmarshal them back onto the same Java types. And if you do that, that can be tricky, because then if there is a new event, well, you're not going to know about the type, so you will just be completely unable to deal with the new event at all. Which may be okay, but um, what, I've, um, what I've learned, and this is, I think, a very interesting lesson, is that very often consumers don't need to know about everything that is part of a new event to be able to make some sense out of it and to do something useful with it. This is especially true, and I've done this a lot, when you're using events as triggers, so instead of saying this event needs to be fully understood by events or uh, event handlers, uh, it needs to know about all of the state because it's going to use that to build up its own internal state, for example, it can simply act as a trigger. I've worked in the domain of medical records, healthcare system, 
where we had a lot of events around the medical records. And some of those events were around the basic administration data of a patient, and some of them were about maybe medicine prescriptions and others about allergies and then yet others about reports. So we had these categories basically of events. And within those categories, we had a lot of different sort of specific types. What you could do there is you could just say, I'm going to tag basically these event types. I'm going to say, oh, these uh, 12 or so events, they're all related to changes in um, medicine prescription information. And of course, all of those events are going to have some stuff in common, like the identifier of the medical record for the patient that is concerned. I can know that as an event handler without understanding the entire thing. So then when I receive a new event that I don't know, but I can still see, hey, it's actually tagged and it has the common fields that I know about, I could still handle that because maybe as an event handler, I'm only going to be interested in this event so that I can tell, let's say, a third party system, hey, something has been updated in the medicine prescription data of this patient. And instead of telling it exactly what that was in a push, I'm going to be telling this other system, you can now come and fetch that data through our public API, which is just some REST API that, that they query. right? And that tends to be a very robust model for various reasons, actually. So this whole notify fetch pattern is something that I think is typically way, way better than just pushing changes and deltas out over the wire to, to external systems all the time. Because that can be really brittle, can be really hard to, to fix if something goes wrong. So this is something that I personally had great success with, um, but it does require a customized setup, of course. This is not something that will work out of the box if you're simply going to take a marshaled Java object in the form of JSON or XML and just try to unmarshal it back onto the corresponding type. So when that type is not available, make sure that you have a mechanism for this if this is a pattern that you would be interested in supporting. Maybe just some base types and then uh, write some custom code that says, in the case that I don't know about the exact type, Maybe I can just do a fallback and at least extract the information that I care about. Right? And this is one example of this corollary that I mentioned. Um, this also helps, although this is not something that I've personally used a lot, if you're going to have other consumers than Java consumers that need to handle your events. Because if the only proper um, contract that describes your events is a Java type, then you're going to have a lot of spe Java specifics uh, in the serialized forms of those events. Whereas if you can actually do some metadata, some annotations, those type of things, that can be tremendously useful so that other things can also make use of your events. Like there is a workshop af this afternoon um, from a colleague of mine where we're going to be talking about um, timeline analysis and, and, and machine learning based on events. Right? These sort of things can can help tremendously in pre-categorizing stuff and recognizing, oh, all of these events actually have something in common. So there's a, a number of reasons for doing this. Also, um, the next step in this is it typically helps if you're building an application with events to think about some events as, oh, this is just purely for internal usage. We need this for our own use cases, for uh, building up aggregate state, that sort of thing versus, hey, these are events that are also interesting for others to learn about. And the reason that this is useful is that there are different requirements for these types of events. If something is publicly shared, it needs to be way more stable. You need to think about how can I evolve this? I can no longer just remove fields that are expected by clients to be there. I cannot change the meaning or the type of certain fields that I have. So basically, the whole, unfortunately, this is an area that is really well described in, in literature and, and everything else already. Everything applies to how you design contracts, how you do that contract first, how you do schema evolution in things like databases, right? Don't just remove stuff, uh, never just rename things, but have duplicate fields and then slowly but surely phase out things. All of that applies to this as well. So you can apply all of these best practices quite easily if you start thinking about what is actually a public event. And then finally, if you're going this route, and you're really starting to think about architecture and really about loosely coupling things, then the obvious next step is to say, well, maybe I should just not have all of my events and just expose them and then say, but you shouldn't look at these events. Maybe I should just have what I know that at least Allard, for example, refers to as milestone events, where instead of having these fine-grained, low-level events that I expect all of the world to make sense of, I'm just going to pre-aggregate that into more coarse-grained events that contain more data, and I'm going to share those with the rest of the world. 
and now I have a super strict contract where it's everything else is just an internal event and I can do whatever with, with that event that I like. And if it's a milestone event, it's by definition, it's public, it's shared. And I can maybe not put it in an event store, I can just put it on a Kafka queue or something like that because there are different use cases. So that's something I have to, to, to consider uh, as you are moving uh, along with your, this is not typically something that people think about on the first day that they're building a system, but you will run into this after a couple of years. Now, change events, fortunately, are a lot easier. Um, if you have an existing event and it starts to have new fields, for example, you um, typically just ignore them. That tends to be a really uh, good way to deal with these things by default, is my experience. It should be trivial to configure this. If you're using, let's say, Jackson with, as a JSON on Marshaller, uh, there's just a setting that says you should ignore unknown fields rather than make a fuss about it and throw exceptions. But um, if you're using Xtreme to do XML marshalling, you can get exactly the same effect there. You can tell Xtreme, just don't worry about it. If you find something in the XML, you cannot map onto a Java type, just ignore it like that. And you should be doing that at least for external event handlers typically. So that's events. Now, uh, as I mentioned, another thing that tends to change when you are um, deploying new versions of applications is expanded aggregate state. So you might have new state that you derive from your events. Um, the problem there is that that means that old snapshots do no longer apply because your snapshots of those aggregates do not have that new state. And that can lead to problems, basically. Um, you need new snapshots, first of all. But also, if you're going to have new snapshots, then those are not compatible with the old version of your application anymore. Now, what's interesting with pure event sourcing, that sometimes people actually say this, we, have, we build a system and it just does event sourcing from scratch every time that we send a command. That's ridiculously inefficient. It doesn't work at all for a system that's been running for a longer period of time already. Right? It's basically going up to someone and saying, hey man, how are you doing? And then you start to think back to the day you were born and everything that happened afterwards until you can answer this question. It's, it's, it's insane. So obviously you're not doing that in a system. They're going to create snapshots and you're going to store that. And then you can just load the snapshots, replay the couple of events afterwards, and that's going to be that. But that doesn't make them an optimization. It makes them a hard necessity. Right? Your application doesn't function without these things. There's other aspects here like caching, but I'm not going to go into that now. But the, the, the naive way of dealing with this which is good enough typically for maybe the first two years of your system, is whenever you're deploying a new version and something changed, just delete all of the snapshots. First time that a command comes in from an aggregate, it will just do all of the event sourcing again, but it's a one-time hit. After that, you're back to having your snapshot, and off you go. And this works well in the beginning, except not for blue-green. But well, <laughs> you're probably not doing that anyways because it's way too hard. However, if you're going to have a lot of events after a couple of years for certain long-lived aggregates, this tends to break down because this on-the-fly re-snapshotting of aggregates, it just doesn't perform well enough. So your whole system will be in a state of shock if you just start to de delete all of the snapshots for a particular aggregate type. It won't be able to deal with that. So you need to create new snapshots up front. You need to be sure that as soon as your new application is up and running, those snapshots are pre-created. Something that was actually announced not announced. Something that I learned the day before this conference last year is that Axon 4 actually supports having multiple types of snapshots for different versions of your aggregate in the same snapshot table, which I think is a really nice feature to, to help you with this. However, it wasn't actually explicitly mentioned at the conference last year. But now you know, this is something that Axon actually supports. Um, but in order to use it, of course, you do have to think about creating a tool that will create these snapshots for you up front. Finally, query projection changes, super common. Almost always when you deploy a new version of the application, there will be something there, right? Um, what, what do you do if something changes? Again, the naive solution, hey, I'm doing event sourcing, so I'm just going to throw everything away, I'm just going to replay everything, and now I have my updated query state. Worked well in the beginning, works for smaller things, but it's just not realistic to do for a big system anymore. So what you often see is that you need a way to update the query state rather than just recreate it from scratch. Um, sometimes uh, you need the tool to actually do this. You may need custom commands and custom events that you only use during the update part of your application to make sure that you update the query state in the way that you 
in Vision E2. And um, this could be done before creating uh, these tools, before doing a deploy. Maybe you need to create new snapshots, as I mentioned. As part of the deploy, updating projections, something you typically want to do there before your system goes live, or even post-deploy uh, to do some, some cleanup afterwards. So deployment automation is another tricky thing, right? It's no longer just a matter of here's my new service, it's a Docker started up and we're live with the new version. You need to do stuff there. So this is something you can automate as far as possible, but you probably won't be able to automate everything. So make sure that you document these things, that you practice these things, um, and build a framework over time to help you support building these sort of tools. So in conclusion, um, what I found is that um, those benefits of CQRS and event sourcing that I mentioned on the, one of the first slides, those are real, right? I'm not dismissing any of that. And you can get true benefits in building architectures like this. And you can get actually some benefits that I think are only achievable by building applications like this. However, architecture is about trade-off. Right? I know this is a platitude, but I've been in the business for 20 years and it's absolutely true. Everything is a trade-off. And the way that you become better at building systems is to know about the trade-offs up front and to think about them and to then make conscious choices and then live with the consequences. And that is what I want everyone to start doing when we're talking about CQRS and event sourcing. And actually what I would like um, is um, more people to start sharing these conclusions. What does it mean to actually have an application running for five years that was built using event sourcing and CQRS that still has events from five years back from aggregates that are still actively being used in an application. What does that mean for, for developing an application, for evolving it, for maintaining it, for deploying new versions? So this is my call to all of you, right? If you are in this situation um, and you have these experiences, please share them. I think it's super important for the community to, to think about not only how to get started with all of this and to describe the benefits, but to actually think about what it actually means to live with the consequences there. And, and test them, right? And not just hope for the best, because that's a recipe for disaster. So that's, that's what I have to say. Um, we might have time for one or two questions, I think. And otherwise, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>